The Brachiosaurus was about 85 feet long and weighed between 30 and 80 tons. But there's a problem. The nostrils were the same size of a modern day horse's nostrils. Did they suffocate? Or was there a different atmosphere on Earth 6,000 years ago? Learn how the environment of the original creation vastly differed from ours today, and how this allowed men to live over 900 years. It produced huge plants and animals and provided perfect conditions for the growth of the dinosaurs. Thank you for joining us. My name is Kent Hovind. I taught high school science for 15 years, and now for 16 years I've been doing seminars on creation, evolution, and dinosaurs. And in this session we're going to talk about what the Garden of Eden was like. Why did they live to be 900 years old before the flood came? What was different about that original creation that we're not seeing today? And tell you how you can uh, see, uh, take God's promise that He's going to restore the earth like it used to be. You can be in on that if you'd like. But first of all, this is not my wife. That's just a picture of her. Uh, we live in Pensacola, Florida, about to get hit by a tropical storm here in the next hour uh, or so. <laughs> We've had a couple hurricanes since I've been there. It's not a too big of a deal. But I have three children, one of each. One of each. I got them all married off and the dog died, so I made it and I'm home free. And so far I have uh, four grandkids, and that's God's reward for not killing your own kids when you thought about it. So. Hopefully more coming. Got the whole tribe right there. They all live right around me and they all come over every day. It's wonderful. Got a great family. They all want to serve God with their life. The Bible says in Colossians chapter 1, by Him, talking about Jesus, were all things created. And they were created by Him and for Him. Jesus created everything. And Jesus said in Matthew 19, 4, Have you not read that He which made them at the beginning made them male and female? Was that really the beginning? Jesus said it was. The Bible says from the beginning of the creation, God made them male and female. The Bible teaches by one man, sin came into the world, and death by sin. By man came death. Evolution teaches death brought man into the world. The Bible says man brought death into the world. These two, two, two views are totally, totally opposite. And the Bible says Adam was the first man. And he was 130 when Seth was born, and Seth was 105 when Enos was born. We covered all that in the last session. If you go through the Bible and add up the dates, it's not that hard to do. You'll come to a date of about 6,000 BC, or 6,000 years ago, 4,000 BC for the creation. That's the dates you get from adding up the ones given in the Bible. So we're going to cover a couple things now. What was it like before the flood came? Is it possible for a person to live over 900 years? You could learn a lot in 900 years. Many people have never thought of this, but do you realize that Adam spoke every language in the world? Because there was only one, okay? Married to the prettiest girl in the world too, by the way. But uh, things were very different back then. <laughs> Textbooks in school are going to tell your kids dinosaurs lived millions of years ago. Is that true? Well, if the earth's only 6,000 years old, that can't be true. Where do dinosaurs fit in? Well, we'll cover that in a minute. Did dinosaurs live millions of years ago, or have they always lived with humans? They just had a different name for them. They called them dragons. Hmm. What was the original creation like? What did they eat before the flood came? What's it going to be like in the 1,000-year reign of Christ when the Lord fixes things back like they used to be? Where did all the water for the flood come from, and where did it go? And were there really giant people on this earth over 10 feet tall? Well, hang on, we're going to try to cover as much of that as we can here, so let's go. The Bible says in 2 Peter chapter 3, Knowing this first, there shall come in the last days scoffers. Did you know there are people that scoff at the Bible? I deal with them on a regular basis. I attract them like a lightning rod. <laughs> the scoffers out there, they hate me. I'm trying to be nice to them, okay, but they just don't like me. They don't appreciate this. what a nice, wonderful guy I am. Okay? The scoffers, the Bible says, are going to be walking after their own lust. You know the reason people scoff at the Bible? It's not because of their science. They think it is, okay, but no. They scoff at the Bible because of their lust. They don't want God telling them what to do. That's the bottom line every single time. 
The scoffers are going to say, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. That's an important phrase. We'll cover that on video four. A very important phrase right there. But the scoffers are going to say, the way things are happening now is the way things have always been happening. Uniformitarianism. We don't have time to cover that now. We'll get to that in part four. The Bible says the scoffers are willingly ignorant. Willingly ignorant. In the Greek, that means dumb on purpose. Okay? The scoffers are dumb on purpose of two things, and here they are. Number one, that by the word of God, the heavens were of old. Notice the word heaven is plural, heavens. There's more than one heaven. We'll talk about that in a minute. The scoffers are ignorant of how God made the heavens by his word and the earth standing out of the water and in the water. Now, there's a strange phrase. How can the earth be out of the water and in the water? But look, it says, the heavens and the earth were made by his word. You know, when God made the universe, he didn't lift one finger. He didn't turn one screw or pound one nail. He just spoke, and every molecule lined up. That's incredible to think about. When he speaks, the waves lay down, the wind quits blowing. When he speaks, the dead come to life. When he speaks, the universe is created. Everything obeys the voice of God, uh, except us. He's having some trouble out of us right now, but he's going to fix that one of these days when every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father, coming soon to a city near you. Mm -hmm. But the scoffers are willingly ignorant of how God made the heavens by his word, and they're ignorant of how the earth was standing out of the water and in the water. In other words, they're ignorant of the original creation. What was it like? We'll talk about that in a second. The second thing they're ignorant of is the flood. It says, the world that then was being overflowed with water perished. This world was destroyed by a flood, totally annihilated. The third thing they're ignorant of is the coming judgment. Next verse says, But the heavens and the earth which are now by the same word are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. See, the scoffers are ignorant of the creation. They don't want to admit God created the world because that would mean he owns it. They don't want to admit there was a flood because, you know, that proves God has the authority to judge his creation. They don't like that idea. And they sure don't want to admit there's a coming judgment. I like that bumper sticker. So Jesus is coming, and boy, is he mad. <laughs> That's the truth. Well, sadly, many Christians are also ignorant of what that original creation was like and what that flood did to this world. And so it, because of their ignorance of the creation and the flood, it causes Christians to compromise the clear teaching of God's Word. Genesis chapter 1. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. By the way, in Genesis 1-1, it's heaven singular. Later, it's always heavens plural. When he first made it, it was heaven, one heaven, and then later he divides it up into three slices. First heaven, second heaven, third heaven. We'll cover that in a second. But look at verse 5. It says, The evening and the morning were the first day. Notice that word, the, T-H-E. In English, that is called the definite article. The first day. This is King James Version, which I use and I recommend everybody use if you speak English. I collect other versions of the Bible. I'm not afraid of them, but folks, there have been some very serious changes made in some of these other versions. Many have left out the blood in dozens of places. Many have uh, taken away the deity of Christ. There's some serious changes. Many have taken out over 200 verses. We cover more on that on video 7 about why the King James, but I got down my Revised Standard Version that I got for perfect attendance in fourth grade at the Methodist Church. I was raised in an extremely liberal Methodist church in the Peoria area. Now, not all Methodists are liberal, but mine really was. You know, Our church had two pulpits. It was really strange. They had one pulpit where they read the Bible from, and then the preacher would walk over to the other pulpit where he would preach from. It took me a long time to figure out why they did that, but finally I figured out it's because what he's reading over here is so far from what he is saying over there. I had to separate him into two pulpits, you know. But, <laughs> but I had perfect attendance in fourth grade, and they gave me the reviled substandard perversion of the Bible. And so I got down my Bible collection, and I was going to see what the, how they treated the Genesis story. You know, what differences are there? And it says in the reversed version, there was evening and there was morning one day. Now wait just a minute. What happened to the first day? How many the first days are there in history? One. How many one days are there in history? All of them, any of them, right? Why did they call it one day? And down in verse 8, they called it a second day instead of the second day. Well, I found out the guys who did the reviled version do not believe in a literal six-day creation. And just about every other translation available changes it from the first day to one day. You can check it out for yourself. These people, many of them, believe in what's called the gap theory. 
How many have ever heard of the gap theory before? The gap theory was made up in 1814 by a Scottish preacher named Thomas Chalmers. He said, there's a gap between verse 1 and verse 2, and there's millions or billions of years in there. Nobody thought of the gap theory till the 1800s, after it became popular to teach the earth was millions of years old. See, in 1715, 1795, a book was written that said the earth is millions of years old, and Christians, some of them believed it and said, wow, we've got to make the Bible say that. And so they scrambled with compromised positions, gap theory, day-age theory, progressive creation. We'll cover more on that in a minute. But the gap theory was one of the ones came up with in 1814 to teach that maybe there's millions or billions of years between the first two verses. That's what I was taught when I went to Bible college. That's what the Schofield Reference Bible teaches too. They say between the first two verses of Genesis, there is ample scope for all the geologic eras. They say there's a pre-Adamite rebellion and the judgment of Lucifer happened. Now, just a minute. Was anybody here before Adam? Was there a pre-Adamite rebellion? And exactly when did Lucifer get judged and fall from heaven? Hmm. Well, we better see what the Scripture says. Genesis 1-2 says, The earth was without form and void. In Hebrew, that's tohu abohu, which means unformed and unfilled. Without form means without form. And void means void, you know, empty. It doesn't mean destroyed. It just means it's not done yet. That's all, okay? A good book on the table out there. If you want to go down deep, stay down long, come up dry, you can read this one on Unformed and Unfilled. Or if you want a shorter, condensed version, get the one that I wrote about the gap theory. To me, it's one of the most dangerous heresies in the history of Christianity, the gap theory. And it is heresy, okay? This house, for instance, is unformed and unfilled. Nobody's living in it. But it's not destroyed. Unformed and unfilled doesn't have to mean destroyed. Now, there is a verse in Jeremiah that uses the same phrase, you know, uh, without form and void. In this case, the Jeremiah passage is talking about a city that has been destroyed. He looked at the mountains, they trembled, the hills moved lightly, there was no man, the birds fled. This can't be talking about the creation. The birds weren't made till day five. This is not talking about the creation. This is talking about a city that's been judged. This passage has nothing to do with the creation. This house also is unformed and unfilled, okay? The Bible says in Exodus 20, in six days, the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that in them is. What do you suppose he meant by that? This, this is part of the Ten Commandments. He wrote this on a rock with his finger, okay? He don't stutter. It looks to me like he's trying to tell us he did it all in six days. Now, would that include Lucifer? Would that include the angels? That would include everything, wouldn't it? Everything in heaven and earth. The question is not, what does it say? The question is, do you believe what it says? So if somebody says Lucifer fell from heaven before the creation, they already have a conflict with this verse. Exodus 20, 11 continues to say, and he rested on the seventh day. If there's a gap between verse 1 and verse 2, this is not the seventh day. Okay, But all through Scripture, it keeps referring to the seventh day. Exodus 31, it's a sign between me and the children of Israel forever. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, and on the seventh day he rested. The seventh day. It mentions it over and over, the seventh day. Hebrews chapter 4, the seventh day. So Romans 5 tells us, by one man sin came into the world, and death by sin. Death reigned from Adam to Moses. By man came death. The Bible's real clear. But if the gap theory is true, and it was a pre-Adamite civilization, and they died when Lucifer fell from heaven, you now have death before sin. A clear heresy. Not at all what the Bible teaches. The Bible says death is an enemy. People say, well, don't plants die? If Adam ate the apple, didn't it die? Oh, you better check, first check out and see if plants are alive. They have no blood, no breath. They wither, they fade. We cover all that on video number seven. Plants are not alive in the biblical classification of things, okay? The Bible says God told Adam to replenish the earth. And the gap theory folks always say, well, see right there, it says replenish. And the word replenish means fill again. Look it up in the dictionary. And sure enough, you look it up in a dictionary and it says replenish, fill again. Well, you better look up at the meaning of the word in 1611 when they translated this. The King James translators came across the word male, which means fill, and they chose the word replenish because back in 1611, the word replenish only meant fill. In 1650, an author named Bacon added a second definition to the word called fill again. It never meant fill again until 1650. You get some old dictionaries, like an 1828 dictionary, you can see for yourself, the primary meaning of the word replenish is fill. The secondary meaning is fill again, recover former fullness, added by Francis Bacon. Okay? 
Here's an 1891 dictionary. The first definition of the word is fill. The second definition is recover, former fullness. In 1892, the dictionary switched the definitions. First one in 1891 is fill. In 1892, the first one is fill again. And the secondary meaning becomes to fill. Huh, what happened here? Modern dictionaries changed it again. 18, or 1989 only shows fill again. They left out what used to be the primary definition of the word, fill. There's a 20, 21st century dictionary, replenish, make full again. See, English words change meanings all the time. When I was a kid, the word cool meant not hot. And gay meant happy. Anybody remember those old-fashioned days? Hmm? Yeah. How would, you quote, how would you decipher this verse here? James chapter 2. You have respect him that weareth the gay clothing. Would you agree that word has changed meanings in the last 30 years or so? And you probably shouldn't say that to somebody today. Wow, you have gay clothing on today. That would not be a good thing to say if you want to keep your teeth, right? Okay. Paul said, I would have come to you, but I was let hitherto. You know the word let used to mean hindered. Now it means allowed. English words change meanings. You see, God promised to preserve His Word. He did not promise to preserve our English language. So, okay. In Ezekiel 28, it tells when Lucifer fell from heaven. It says, thou, Thus saith the Lord, Thou sealest up the sum, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. Thou, Lucifer, hast been in Eden. It talks about him here, all those precious stones and everything. It says, In the day that thou wast created. Hmm. Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth. He said, verse 15, Thou wast perfect in thy ways from the day that thou wast created till iniquity was found in thee. We can learn several things about Lucifer in this passage. Number one, he was created. It says so twice. He's not eternal like God is. He was created. Okay. Secondly, he was in Eden. And thirdly, he was in Eden until he sinned. Well, the Garden of Eden wasn't made till day six. So you can't say Lucifer fell from heaven between verse 1 and verse 2 because the Garden of Eden hadn't been made yet. Lucifer was in Eden as a nice guy probably for quite a while. Ezekiel tells us that Satan got proud. He was lifted up. He said, I'm a god. He was lifted up because of his wisdom, because of his riches, because of his beauty, because of his power. The four things that still corrupt people today, okay? Wisdom, riches, beauty, and power, okay? His heart was lifted up. And, but in uh, Job chapter 38, it tells us before this happened, he was one of the sons of God, because angels in, uh, old, sons of God in the Old Testament, five times is mentioned, it always refers to angels. He said, where wast thou when I laid the foundations of the earth, and all the sons of God, the angels, shouted for joy? Apparently, everybody was excited when God laid the foundations of the earth. Lucifer would have been in this group, and he's excited, wow, God's going to do something on this planet. But when was that? Well, it says when he laid the foundations of the earth. Not when he created the earth, when he laid the foundations. I believe that was day three when he made the dry land appear. It was first created, it was a ball of water without form and void, and then he made the dry land appear on day three, which means angels must have been made on day one or day two. The Bible doesn't tell us, but it had to be one of those two days because everything was created in six days. And Lucifer was created. At the end of day six, God looked at everything and said it was very good. It would not be very good if the devil was running around as a bad guy. Everything was very good, okay? People say, aren't created and made different words with different meanings? No, they're used interchangeably. God said, let us make man in our image, so he created man in his image. I've got in video 7 a whole list of all kinds of things throughout Scripture. The trees are made, the trees are created. The insects are made, the insects are created. The birds are made, the birds are created. I cover all kinds of verses on video 7 about that. The Gap Theory folks teach us that the first earth was destroyed and the, God had to remake the earth. Uh, John Hagee has a beautiful chart he preaches in front of. He's got the first earth was destroyed when Satan fell from heaven and then the second earth. And he said, someday God's going to make a third earth. And it's a good sermon and it preaches good and it's a beautiful chart. He's got a good artist, but it's not scriptural. We're still standing on the first earth. Revelation 21 tells us, I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the... First heaven and first earth were passed away. This is still the first one. It got rearranged at the flood a little bit, you know, but this is still the first earth. Uh, Hebrews tells us, he, said he made the angels to be ministering spirits to those who are heirs of salvation. If you're a Christian, you got guardian angels. 
Mine get to retire early, every about every six months. They say, Lord, can you give me somebody else? Have you seen him drive? Lord, I would like a different one, please. They're going to kill me down there. And here's some things to consider, okay? Number one, everything was created in six days. Number two, Satan was created. Satan was in Eden until he sinned. Eden was made on day six. Angels are made to be ministering spirits for us, so why would God make them millions of years before we get here, okay? Satan rejoiced when the foundations of the earth were laid. The foundations were laid on day three. Everything was very good at the end of day six, and Adam was 130 when Seth was born. And before that, Cain and Abel were born, but no dates are given. So if you put two and two together, you can figure out, you know, Satan must have fallen from heaven probably about 100 years after the creation. He could not have fallen from heaven before the creation. It doesn't fit the other scriptures. 1 Peter 2 tells us, no prophecy of the scriptures of any private interpretation. 1 Peter 1.20, okay? So you've got to take scripture with scripture, and that's the only way you're going to fit it together. Gap theory was invented by a Scottish theologian named Thomas Chalmers. It violates many scriptures. It puts death before sin. It has Satan fall before day seven. It has, uh, lot, there are lots of questions you can ask gap theory people if they believe this. Okay, you get my little book about the gap theory if you'd like more on that. The arguments for the gap theory are either extremely weak or wrong or involve adding to God's word. I'm not aware of any arguments for the gap theory that hold up to a real scrutiny compared to scripture. So I got down my living Bible in my Bible collection. And it said, let the earth burst forth with every sort of grass and seed-bearing plant and fruit trees. This occurred on the third day. I read that and I said, yay, we have got a good one here. Until I saw the footnote at the bottom. At the bottom, Ken Taylor put, this is a period of time. Instead of a day, each day is a long period of time. How many have ever heard that idea before? Maybe the days of Genesis are not days. Maybe they're long periods of time. They always quote Psalms chapter 90. You know, a thousand years is like yesterday, or 2 Peter 3, one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is a day. Well, notice, both of those verses say thousand, not million, okay? And neither of these verses have anything to do with the creation. They're just telling us that time doesn't mean anything to God. See, this is not 2005 in heaven. There is no time there. When somebody says, what did God do before the creation? Right away, you've got to realize they're thinking about something that's not God. Because the God of the Bible is not affected by time, space, or matter. We are the ones that are locked into time, space, matter. God is not. If God is locked and limited by time, He's not God. So there is no time before the creation. God created time. <laughs> we cover more on that on video 7 also. But uh, See, one of these days... It's going to stop again. There'll be no time in heaven. We sing the songs, you know, when we've been there 10,000 years. Well, it's a great song, and I love it, but uh, it's not scriptural. We're not going to be there 10,000 years. We're just going to be there. No more time. First thing you do when you get to heaven, take off your watch and flip it over to the side. You won't need that anymore. Take out that pocket calendar, toss it over. You won't need that anymore. Never be late again. So before the creation, there was no time. At the end, there's going to be no time. The angel flew by and said, there shall be time no longer. Hmm. Which means, if you really think about it, once upon a time, there was a time when there was no time. Even try to think about that one and your brain will start hurting. But uh, here's the Farrar Fenton Bible from 1903. He said, by periods, God created that which produced the solar systems, then that which produced the earth. Now, does that sound like Genesis 1, 1 to you? How about verse 5? This was the close in the dawn of the first age. The close in the dawn of the second age. He's trying awful hard to make the Bible say the earth is millions of years old. <laughs> okay. The Bible didn't sell very well, by the way. So you look down at verse uh, 11. God said, let the earth bring forth grass, herbs, and fruit trees on the third day. On the fourth day, he made the sun. Now, if those days are millions of years, that's going to be kind of hard on them plants waiting for the sun to come up, don't you think? Hmm? And on the fifth day, he made the insects, and they pollinate the plants. So if those guys teach the days are long periods of time, you've got a real serious problem here, because now you've got to have plants with no sun and no insects and birds to pollinate them, lasting for millions of years. That's a miracle. Big-time miracle, I would say. No professor of Hebrew will tell you that the days in Genesis mean anything other than 24-hour days. Now, they might not believe that, but that's, they know that's what the book teaches. The book clearly teaches the days of Genesis are normal days. 
They always say, doesn't the word yom mean, you know, day? Could it mean long, like the day of the Lord? There is one reference out of the 1,800 times yom is used. It always means a day, okay? There are three meanings of the word day. 24-hour day. Jesus said, are there not 12 hours in the day? That's the daylight portion of the day. And then it says, in the day of the Lord. Now, is that talking about a long period of time, or is that also just one day? I don't know. I think that's just one day also. But certainly when it says evening and morning and the first day, the second day, there is no reason to say these days are anything other than 24-hour days just like we have today. No verses in the Bible where the word yom is used indicate anything other than a 24-hour day. Get the Gap Theory book if you want to go down deep on that one, okay? Or my little booklet, The Gap Theory. James Hutton wrote a book in 1795, and people began to think the earth is millions of years old. Thomas Chalmers entered the, invented the gap theory to try to fit that into the Bible, and it's been swallowed by Christians ever since. It's not scriptural. And Darwin's book came out in 1859, and by then Christians had already accepted the idea that the earth is millions of years old. And so there was really no effective resistance to the evolution theory when it came out. The Christians didn't even fight against Darwin's theory because they'd already accepted the age of the earth as being billions of years old. That's why I say it's a dangerous, dangerous heresy. Okay? And today, 75% of kids from Christian homes that go to public schools are going to reject the Christian faith, mostly because of this great age of the earth issue, which we covered yesterday. How to prove the earth is not billions of years old. Hugh Ross, of course, teaches each of the days are long periods of time. He's got a, re a website, Reasons to Believe. I debated him for three hours on the John Ankerberg Show. He won't do it again. I'll debate him anytime, anywhere. He's an extremely smart man. I'm sure he's a very sincere man, loves the Lord. I wouldn't question that. But he's wrong in what he believes. And just because somebody's nice and smiles and very smart doesn't mean they're right. Okay? <laughs> Compare Scripture with Scripture. Search the Scriptures, okay? See if these things are so. So Genesis chapter 1 says, Let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. Well, what is a firmament? Some people say it must be the dirt, you know, because the dirt keeps the water away from the water. No, it's not the dirt. Read down to verse number 20, and it says, The fowls, that's the birds, fly above the earth in the open firmament of heaven. The birds fly in the firmament. The birds do not fly in the dirt. Okay, the birds fly in the air. So the first heaven is telling us right here is where the birds fly, okay? The scripture interprets itself, okay? Second heaven is where the sun, moon, and stars are. God said, let there be lights in the firmament. Talks about the sun, moon, and stars. That's the second heaven. The third heaven... It's only mentioned once in the Bible, right here, 2 Corinthians chapter 12. The Apostle Paul is telling the story about the time he got rocked to sleep, I mean, uh, stoned to death, and he said he was caught up to the third heaven. Three heavens mentioned in the Bible. First heaven where the birds fly, second heaven where the stars are, third heaven where God lives. We're going to go up there one of these days. We're going to hear a trumpet blast. Do -do -do -do. Lutherans take off first. <laughs> you know, dead in Christ rise first. And then we're going to take a bite off the Milky Way and... We end up going to the third heaven. Mm -hmm. yeah, going to be there soon. Okay. Psalm 19 talks about the heavens, plural, declare the glory of God. Heavens. Remember Genesis 1.1, 1, 1, it's heaven singular. Then he divides it up into three slices. First heaven, second heaven, third heaven. Heavens declare the glory of God. Verse 7 says, God made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament. Now, wait a minute. Is he telling us there was water above where the birds fly? Psalm 148 says, Praise him, ye waters that be above the heavens. Maybe there is still water beyond outer space. The Bible says the Lord sits on many waters. Maybe this whole thing that we see, this huge universe with all these bazillions of stars, maybe the whole thing is surrounded by water. That's the only verse I've got to back up this theory. But maybe everything we see is all, one of, is all inside one of them little glass balls on God's dresser that you pick up and you shake once in a while, you know, and the snowflakes float around, you know. And God says, how you all doing in there? Here you go. <laughs> so first, uh, second Peter tells us, the earth was standing out of the water and in the water. Apparently, when God first made the earth, there was a canopy of water or ice above the atmosphere. It's not there now. It all fell down at the time of the flood. But Isaiah tells us, the Lord sits on the circle of the earth. <laughs> Interesting. 3,000 years ago, the Bible said the earth is round. Christians have never taught the earth is flat. 
Some heathens have believed that and tried to blame it on the Christians, but we've always known the earth is round. But then it says, He stretched out the heavens. Seventeen times in the Bible it says He stretches out the heavens. Maybe that's why we have a red shift in astronomy. And people say, how did the light get from the stars to here? Oh, you got it all backwards. The Bible says God made the earth first and then the stars. So the question is, how did the stars get from here to there? Not how did the light get from there to here? Cover more on that on video 7. But he stretched out the heavens. Interesting. Today's atmosphere that we're breathing has six layers. Troposphere, stratosphere, mesosphere, thermosphere, exosphere, and ionosphere. There used to be a seventh layer. It was a layer of water or ice above the atmosphere. I don't know what it was because it's gone now. Okay, All we can do is make a theory about it. This is called the canopy theory, which says there was a layer of water or ice, probably ice, above the atmosphere. I happen to believe it's probably 10 or 20 inches of ice, super cold ice, suspended by the magnetic field. You know how a magnet can float on top of another magnet? It's called the Meissner effect. We cover more on that in video 6. But the Earth could have had a canopy of ice suspended in the magnetic field, which would float it above the Earth. This ice or water would block out UV light, some of it. It would increase air pressure. Today, the air is about 100 miles thick. It would squeeze it all down probably to 10 or 20 miles and double the air pressure on the surface. By the way, when the space shuttle blasts off and leaves all that exhaust behind, it's forming ice clouds and the ice clouds float to the north and south pole and hover there about 50 miles above the Arctic. Ice clouds that are floating, they won't fall. Apparently stuck in the magnetic field, I don't know. But article about that here. Josephus wrote in his book that the Hebrews believed when God made the earth on the second day, he placed a crystalline firmament around it. A crystalline firmament. Probably super cold ice, okay? There was not only a canopy of water above the earth, there was water in the crust of the earth. Psalm 24 says, The earth is the Lord's. He founded it upon the seas and established it upon the floods. See, most of the water that's now in the oceans used to be in the crust of the earth. Psalm 136 says, He stretched out the earth above the waters. It's not the way it is today. I believe the original creation had a layer of water above, maybe 10 or 20 inches, who knows, of ice probably, and then a layer of air to breathe, probably 10 or 20 miles, I don't know. And then dirt and rocks to stand on, the crust of the earth, which we still have. But inside the crust of the earth, there was water. That's the water that came shooting to the surface when the fountains of the deep broke open. By the way, there is still lots of water in the crust of the earth. Otherwise, you could not have hot water vents shooting up into the bottom of the ocean. If you have hot water squirting up into the bottom of the ocean, where does it have to be coming from? lower than that, doesn't it? Still huge hot water vents in the bottom of the ocean. I think some of that water is still coming out. We cover more on that in the hydroplate theory on video 6. But I think the earth today still has cracks where it broke open at the time of the flood. I taught earth science for years. The earth is broken up into plates. There's no question. I've been to the San Andreas Fault, the Hayward Fault, the New Madrid Fault, the Golden Fault. None of them are my fault, but I've been there, okay? There's no question. There are cracks in the earth's crust, and when they move around, Buildings fall down. It's called earthquakes, okay? Or tsunamis happen from the, from the underwater landslides and turbidity currents. There's no question the earth is broken up, and there's no question the plates are still moving. The question is, when did all this happen? Now, the evolutionist will tell you this happened over millions and millions of years. The creationist says, no, all this catastrophe probably started at the time of that flood when the fountains of the deep broke open. That's what caused the fault lines. And the water went shooting to the surface, and it's still here today. I was debating an atheist one time, and during Q&A time, this student stood up and said, Hoven, where'd all the water from the flood go? I said, oh, it's still here. I said, the oceans are huge. There's enough water in the oceans. If you smoothed out the earth, it would cover the earth a mile and a half deep everywhere. I flew back over to Pacific from Australia. I told one of the guys in my office, I said, man, that Pacific Ocean is huge. He said, oh, that's just the top of it. <laughs> what a thought. These hot water vents are proof there's water in the crust of the earth still squirting up. Probably most of it's gone now. It's on the surface. But this canopy of water that used to be there in the original creation would make the whole earth like a big greenhouse. How many know what a greenhouse is? They've got all glass walls. You have to dress in the basement if you live in a greenhouse. Well, scientists are still finding lots of water in space between the stars. There's lots of water out in space. Interesting. We'll cover more on that later. And they've got a new theory now that says maybe a lack of oxygen killed the dinosaurs. A lack of oxygen. Why would they say that? Well, they had a big symposium in 1993. A bunch of scientists got together to study the apatosaurus. 
And they said, folks, we've got a problem. An 80-foot apatosaurus had nostrils the same size as a horse. How is an 80-foot animal going to get enough air through nostrils the same size as a horse? He'd be sucking so hard trying to get a breath. It set him on fire from the friction from the wind whistling in there. <clears throat> they couldn't breathe. Well, apparently they did breathe because bones of dinosaurs are found all over the planet, even in Antarctica and Alaska. I mean, dinosaurs lived everywhere, okay? So how could an 80-foot animal get enough air? Well, today he probably couldn't, not to get 80 feet long. But I think before the flood came, they had this canopy of air or of water or ice that would increase air pressure. Plus, they had richer oxygen. You know, when they drill into the amber, how many saw the movie Jurassic Park, you know, where they drilled in to get the mosquito blood out? Sometimes in amber, which is petrified tree sap, they find air bubbles in the amber. When they analyze the air bubbles, they find out they're 50% more oxygen than we have today. Today we're breathing 21% oxygen. Amber bubbles have 32% oxygen. Do you know if you lived in a world with double the air pressure and 50% more oxygen, just breathing would be exciting. Adam would go, wow, that was fun. <laughs> hey, Eve, let's do that again. Ready, go. The earth had more oxygen in the past than it does now. Now, you kids are going to be told in textbooks that the earth had no oxygen at the beginning when life was evolving, called a reducing atmosphere. That is baloney. We cover all that about uh, video four, about how life began. <laughs> Could not have evolved with oxygen or without oxygen. But if you double the air pressure and increase oxygen, not only does your hemoglobin take on oxygen like it's supposed to, <clears throat> your plasma will get oxygen saturated, which means you could run hundreds of miles without getting tired. Adam and Eve didn't need a car. They could run to grandma's. Only they didn't have a grandma. Or a mother-in-law, by the way. That's why it was paradise. But, um, <laughs> actually, my wife had a great mother-in-law. But uh, I think before the flood came, <clears throat> I think things were a whole lot different. With increased oxygen, you would heal up much faster. How many of you remember baby Jessica that fell into the well in Texas? 18 months old, her left leg slipped down in a pipe, her right leg came up behind her and she did the splits as she slid down inside an eight inch steel pipe. She went down 20 feet and was stuck there for two and a half days. They tore up the whole neighborhood trying to get that kid out of that well. It was on the news about every 15 minutes. Remember that, you know, baby Jessica is still alive. When they finally got her out of that well, lots of her body had turned black from lack of circulation. Her right leg was totally black because it had been twisted around and stuck in her face from behind, doing the splits. One of the doctors said, we have to cut her leg off immediately. Another doctor said, hey, before we cut the leg off, let's just try putting her in a hyperbaric oxygen chamber. You know what? Hyperbaric oxygen. They put Jessica in one of these chambers, filled it up full of pure oxygen, and pumped it up to double normal pressure. Within a few hours, her leg turned pink. They restored circulation. They saved her leg. They did have to amputate half of her little toe, okay? They couldn't save that. It beats losing a leg by a long shot. By the way, do you know what you call a girl if one leg is shorter than the other? Eileen. <laughs> Just a little bit of trivia there, okay? Uh, <clears throat> there's a lot chamber in Pensacola, Florida. This one in Pensacola holds 30 people in an emergency. A lot of hospitals are getting these hyperbaric chambers. Does UT Medical Center have a hyperbaric chamber? They do? You know how big it is? Is it one or two or three person or one person? Okay. West Germany is treating stroke patients with hyperbaric oxygen, getting incredible recovery from strokes. In England, they're treating multiple sclerosis. They treat all kinds of diseases with hyperbaric chambers. In India, they're treating leprosy, getting incredible results. Here's a kid being treated for cerebral palsy with hyperbaric oxygen. Doctors have discovered if they add more oxygen during surgery when the person's under anesthetic, only half as many patients get infections and only half as many people get nauseated just by giving the sleeping patient more oxygen. Interesting. There's a chamber in New York that treats autism with hyperbaric oxygen. Hyperbaric therapies use as healing tool grows, article says. Here's a single person chamber. Did you know the Dallas Cowboys have a hyperbaric chamber? Why would professional sports teams want a hyperbaric chamber? Well, because they've discovered their injured players will heal twice as fast. 
See, if you're paying the guy $1,000 a minute to go play with a ball, you want him out there playing with the ball. Okay, earning his $1,000 a minute or whatever they get. Here's a Zach, somebody from the Dolphins. It says, about three times a week during the season, Zach chills out for an hour or so in a hyperbaric chamber, a 12 by 4 bag inflated with pure oxygen that helps the body heal and promotes a feeling of well-being. Hmm. You can get your own hyperbaric sleeping bag if you want. A friend of mine in Oregon has a hyperbaric chamber. Here's my son running the camera back there and his wife and I at an oxygen bar in Alaska. Not a bar where you drink alcohol. I've never had alcohol in my life, okay? But you sit down to eat lunch and you breathe pure oxygen. You pay them five bucks and you breathe pure oxygen while you're eating lunch. And when you get done, you, man, you feel like going shopping again. It's a conspiracy, I can tell you right now. The whole thing's a conspiracy to get you to spend more money, okay? But then you feel great. My friend in Oregon has a hyperbaric chamber. I was out there. He said, Brother Hovind, would you like to try it? I said, yeah. He put me in there, gave me a book to read, said, I'm going to shut the door and pump it up to triple normal pressure. They, they use the diving terms. You're going to dive to 90 feet. Well, you're sitting right there in the chamber. You don't go anywhere, but it's like scuba diving to 90 feet. He said, now, <clears throat> I'll let you out in about an hour. I was in there breathing pure oxygen for an hour, reading my book, under triple normal pressure. When he let me out, he said, how do you feel? I said, I feel like running around the world. This is incredible. Now, how many of you old-timers, your get-up-and-go done got up and went? You know what I'm talking about? You, yeah. <laughs> Most exciting thing you can think of is taking a nap Sunday afternoon, right? Well, man, in the pre-flood world, if they had to double the air pressure and increased oxygen, you would just be full of energy all the time. There's a guy in Japan started raising tomato plants with pressurized carbon dioxide. You know, plants breathe CO2, not oxygen. His tomato plant grew faster than normal. When it was two years old, it was nine, uh, 14, 16 feet tall and produced 900 tomatoes. They moved it to a shopping center and built scaffolding to hold the branches up. They said, you know, this thing might produce 10,000 tomatoes. This is one tomato plant. It ended up growing 40 feet tall and producing 15,000 tomatoes off one plant. They were, it was a cherry tomato plant, but they were, his tomatoes were coming off baseball size, off of his. A guy in Iowa got curious, you know, why do the birds start chirping an hour before sunrise? He found out the chirping of the birds is a certain frequency that opens up the stomata on the leaf cells. You know, the leaf, if you look underneath with a magnifying glass, has got these little holes in there that open up to let the CO2 come in. It wakes the leaf up in the morning. Well, he discovered that this frequency is found quite a bit in classical music. So he started playing Beethoven and Bach and Chopin to his cornfield. His neighbors thought, you know, un poquito loco a la cabeza, you know. He's about a half a bubble off a plum or something, you know. But cheese done fell out of his sandwich. Anyway, they thought he was nuts until his corn grew 15 feet tall. He played it to his squash plants and they grew, they grew five squash per leaf instead of one. He played it to his black walnut tree and it grew twice as fast as normal. He, his potatoes got t double or triple normal potato size. His cantaloupe were the size of soccer balls. He called it Sonic Bloom. There's a good magazine called Creation Illustrated. I've got one on the table down here. There are two Creation magazines, regular Creation magazine, that's a good one, and Creation Illustrated, which you can go to my website, just click on the dot to go to Creation Illustrated. They'll send you a free copy to try it. It's 20 bucks a year if you want to subscribe. But if you go to my website, Dr. Dino, you can click on that and get a free copy. It's, there's an article in there in one of the past issues about this uh, sonic bloom, which is really incredible. It's sitting on the table down here. Sign up for it on the drdino.com. I debated Jeannie Scott. She's the president of the National Center for Science Education in Berserkley, California. The National Center is a little bitty storefront building with five people in there. <clears throat> the National Center for Science Education. But I debated Jeannie Scott in a debate, and uh, she said, Dr. Hoven, there are 80 separate layers of coal in the Midwest. She's right. She said, if you look at the amount of coal in the world today, the entire biomass, all the plants of the world today, could not possibly be converted to that much fossil fuel. She's right again. There is so much coal in the world that if you took every tree and blade of grass and bush and squished it, you couldn't make all the coal. There are enormous volumes of coal in the earth. I said, Jeannie, you are right. She said, well, don't you see, Hoven? There had to be an enormous amount of time to lay down all the coal seams. Oh, no, no, no. Right there, she's wrong. You see, she's looking at today's world and assuming that's how it's always been. 
The coal we find in the ground today is a result of that flood which buried the world before the flood when they had lots more trees. There's a coal mine in Montana that is 10,000 square miles of coal up to 200 feet thick. Someone told me a few months ago they've now found a seam 300 feet thick. That's a lot of coal. A lot of coal. And sometimes in coal, human artifacts are found. This bell was found inside a lump of coal. This iron pot was found inside a lump of coal. The sole of a shoe found inside a lump of coal. We cover more on that on video 6 about coal formation. But the Bible says there were herbs, that's plants, over all the earth. It's not that way today. 70% of the earth is underwater, for heaven's sake. Okay, that's not covered with plants. The earth was covered with plants when God made it. Did you know they find leaves in Antarctica? 250 miles from the South Pole, they're finding leaves. There are no trees in the South Pole. 70% of the earth today is underwater. Did you know only 3% of this earth is habitable for mankind? A lot of it's under desert, ice caps, tundra, mountain ranges that nobody can live on. 3% is habitable. What we're seeing today is not what Adam and Eve saw. The Bible says he formed it to be inhabited. That's why he did it. Probably the pre-flood world was, I would just be picking a number and say probably 80% land and only 20% water. The oceans weren't there. They, the water was in the crust of the earth or in the canopy overhead. But there, was, there were trees from pole to pole before the flood came. This layer of water above the earth would act as a barrier that would block out UV light and x-rays and other harmful things that come from the sun. See, the sun produces a lot of stuff besides light. It produces x-rays and gamma rays and beta rays, and all them ray boys come down here, and they're pretty hard on your carcass. X-rays particularly are dangerous. How many have ever had an x-ray before? I broke nine bones growing up. My brother broke 21. <laughs> we played rough in our neighborhood. One of my neighbors shot his brother through the leg with a crossbow. <laughs> he said, I didn't know it was loaded. <laughs> How can you not know a crossbow is loaded? Oh, duh. Anyway, you go to the hospital and they say, take off all your clothes and put this little gown on. You put this little gown on, you know, and they say, no, it doesn't, quite, it doesn't quite come together in the back. You know, it's kind of embarrassing. And then they say, now walk down the hall about 12 miles and you'll see the x-ray room. Well, if you make it all that way, they'll say, oh, we're so glad you made it. Would you please lay on this table? And they just got the table out of the freezer a few minutes before you got there. How many been on that same table? Now, you know what I'm talking about. It's ice cold. And he puts this weird machine on top of you, and the doctor says, okay, now take a deep breath and hold it. And he runs out in the hall. <laughs> and he's got a lead apron on. You say, Doc, come here. Is this machine dangerous? He says, no, it's harmless. He's lying. He said, Doc, how does this machine work? He says, well, when I mash the button, x-ray bullets come out of that machine, and they're going to go right through your body like a machine gun, and we're going to blow you full of holes, billions of them, little tiny x-ray holes. We're going to actually make a shadow of what's inside your body, which, by the way, is why many radiologists have a negative outlook on life. <clears throat> but we're going to blow you full of holes. But he knows it's dangerous for long-term exposure to x-rays. So that's why he's got the lead apron and runs out behind the lead wall. He don't want to get exposed to those x-rays. But a lot of people don't realize the sun x-rays us every day. We're being x-rayed right now. Now, concrete will stop x-rays and water will stop x-rays. But this roof on this church will not stop x-rays. They're coming right through the roof and right through your body. And you're being x-rayed as you sit there. Not a thing you can do about it. Well, I'll tell you in a minute what you can do about it. But your skin feels the full force of these x-rays. And your body has to fix the damage. I mean, you fix millions of holes in your skin every single day. Millions of them. And after 50 or 60 years, or 70 or 80 for sure, everybody around you starts to notice you are losing the battle for damage control. Your skin begins to wrinkle up. You say, Brother Hovind, I, I, I don't want to get old and wrinkled. Okay. If you don't want to get wrinkled, there are three things you can do about it. Number one, you can die early. <laughs> Number two, you can carry a lead or a concrete umbrella over your head at all times. Do not ever get exposed to the x-rays. Or number three, you can do what Elizabeth Taylor has done. How many have ever heard of Elizabeth Taylor, the movie star? Somebody told me years ago, she's got a hole in her forehead. Every morning she fills it in with caulk and covers it up with makeup, and it's really tough to see, but, you know, it's top secret, actually. 
But I was at Walmart one time, you know, checking out, trying to, you know, check out a Walmart. And there's all these magazines right there beside me. And one of them had Elizabeth Taylor's picture on the front. She was getting married for the 40th time or something, you know. And I thought, hey, I'm going to check this out. I heard about this hole in her forehead, but, you know, I wanted to see it for myself. So I got my Swiss Army knife out, which has a magnifying glass on it. And I picked up the magazine and I began staring at her forehead. People are walking down the aisle looking at me. I said, hey, what's the matter with you? I'm just looking at a magazine, huh? Go shop, right? I looked at it for a while, and I finally figured out what the hole was. I was so proud of myself. That lady has had so many facelifts down through the years trying to get rid of the wrinkles. It's her belly button right there. <laughs> hey, go to Walmart. She's probably getting married again this week. You can see her picture on there. You say, well, Brother Hovind, I don't want to get old and wrinkled. I'm sorry. If you get old, you're going to get wrinkled, okay? You might as well get ready for it. But that didn't happen before the flood. The Bible says before the flood came, they lived to be over 900 years old and probably didn't wrinkle. One guy is going around, he claims he's a creationist. He says, now folks, uh, they didn't really live to be 900. They counted every month as a year. They used a lunar calendar, and you have to divide those numbers by 12. Wow, that's an even bigger miracle. Enoch was 65 when he begat Methuselah. Two of these guys are 65. Let's see, divided by 12. That makes him five and a half when he became a daddy. <laughs> I doubt that real seriously. Okay. I'd have a hard time believing that. No, they really were living to be 900, and they got bigger. Here's me by Robert Wadlow, tallest man in this century, 8 foot 11 and a quarter, had a size 37 shoe. Pretty big boy, okay? Robert Wadlow would have been just a few inches shorter than Goliath, who was about nine foot five or six. Robert Wadlow, at age 12, was the world's tallest Boy Scout. Here he is, age 12, with his Boy Scout troop. We would consider that gigantic at almost nine feet tall, wouldn't we? But I think uh, before the flood, they got even bigger than that. Here's a skeleton of a man, 11 foot six inches tall. Well, long, not tall. He's laying down now. 11'6". How'd you like to have one of those guys on your basketball team? Well, UT would be the champs from now on, wouldn't they? 11 foot 6. Now, sometimes the women get upset with me and they say, Hoven, you said that was a skeleton of a man. Maybe it was a woman. Well, I taught biology and anatomy. Okay, I happen to know how to tell the difference between a male and female skeleton. It is not the number of ribs. Only Adam was missing a rib, and only for a short time. Because there's only one bone in the human body that'll grow back if you take it out. Your lower rib will grow back if you remove it. You know, lizard's tail grows back if you cut it off. The lower rib will grow back if you take it out. Boy, you'd almost think God knew what he was doing if you didn't know better. But anyway, there are two ways to tell the difference between a male and female skeleton. One way is to look at the feet. If they're pointed toward the mall, it's a woman. The other way is to look at the process on the temporal mandibular joint. If that joint right there is worn out more, <clears throat> it's a woman. <laughs> One lady said, that's because we have to tell you men everything twice. You don't listen first time. <laughs> guilty, guilty. Tallest man today, it was 8 foot 4 when this picture was taken. I've been told he's now 8 foot 7, living in Ukraine. Pretty good sized boy. 8 foot 7, big hands. There he is trying to use a cell phone. That'd be tough, wouldn't it? <laughs> Roman Emperor Maximus was 8 foot 6 2,000 years ago, where we get our word maximum from. A 9 foot 8 inch skeleton was found in Indiana. Two skeletons, 9 feet tall, found in Virginia City. Every skeleton found in this mine, in, uh, I mean, in this burial mound in Louisiana, 20 skeletons were found, all of them 9 feet tall. Skeleton 10 feet tall, found in Humboldt Lake, Nevada. And in Guam, they have a legend that the giants used to live on the island of Guam and built these big latte stones over there. In Indiana, eight giants were found, ranging from eight to nine feet long, wearing heavy copper armor. The museum was not interested in them. Why would a museum not be interested in nine-foot skeletons to put on display? Could it be that there's a theory called evolution which says we started off small and we're getting bigger? Which makes us feel important, of course, you know, or evolving. Ye shall be as gods. You're getting better. Could it be the truth is exactly the opposite? People were much bigger before the flood, and now we're getting worse. And maybe they're trying to hide that. A 12-foot skeleton found in Lompoc Rancho, California. Another 12-footer found in Tucson, Arizona. The guy had six toes. 
six fingers, six toes, and a bird-shaped headdress. When the Mexicans, Cortez, went to uh, Mexico and conquered part of it, the people who lived there said, oh, there used to be giants that lived on this continent. They brought a bone of one of these guys out. Just the thigh bone was as tall as Cortez. Just the thigh bone. And he said, I'm a man of good size. He said, I'm a good-sized guy, and this was the same size as me. This is a giant block of rock. Who on earth is moving these things? Consider that's a camel in front of it for scale. Who's cutting and moving these things? This is a 39-pound axe head. Swing a 10-pound sledge for a few minutes and see why I'm wondering who's swinging a 39-pound axe head. This is a stone designed to be held between the thumb and finger for chipping. The Smithsonian is responsible for hiding most of the discoveries of giant humans. They don't want people to know about these giants because it goes against the evolution theory. This skull used to be on display in Winnemucca, Nevada until a few years ago when they took it down. It's in the basement. You have to specially ask to see it. A giant human skull. Here's a normal human thumb bone. Underneath is a giant human thumb bone. This is part of a skeleton found at a grave in Turkey right near Mount Ararat. The government of Turkey says they have found the grave of Noah. The skeleton was 12 feet tall. Now that would make his cubit a little bigger, wouldn't it? People say, one man and three boys could never build a boat that size. Huh, you didn't see those boys. Hey, Bubba, bring me that tree, would you? <laughs> sure, Dad, where do you want it? We've got a replica of a thigh bone in our museum from a guy that would have been about 13 feet tall. If you meet a guy like that, call him Sir. There's an article on the table all about it down here, if you want to read more on this one. These jaw bones are on display at a hotel in Turkey, six and a half inches across the TMJs. Any one of you could put your head inside the jaw and bounce it around. Waukesha, Wisconsin, they found a human skull three times the size of ordinary humans, found in an Indian burial mound. Giants were on the earth in those days. That's what the Bible says. There were giants here. Well, the Bible says we're made in God's image. Now, if we're made in God's image, why do we pay to teach the kids that this is Grandpa? What is the truth about the cavemen? Where do cavemen fit into this picture anyway? I mean, if the Bible's true and the earth's only 6,000 years old, what about the cavemen? Well, we'll cover that after a quick break. Cavemen, coming next. We're going to continue now talking about the Garden of Eden and what it was like. On seminar part 2B here, we're going to talk about the cavemen and quite a few other topics. The Bible says in Genesis 1, God would said, I'm going to make man in his own image. If we're made in the image of God, why do we teach the kids? Grandpa was an ape. Now, evolution teaches we're getting better and someday we're going to become God. The facts are, we're getting worse. Things are falling apart. We now have an incredible genetic load. We are mentally and physically deficient compared to Adam and Eve. Things are not getting better. But we all teach the kids in the textbooks, this is Grandpa. What's the truth about the cavemen? Is it possible for an ape-like creature to turn to a human? <laughs> well, it depends what you mean by caveman, okay? There are people today who live in caves, okay? We don't call them half ape, half human. There's the world's most wanted caveman right there, Osama bin Laden. There's a former caveman. <clears throat> I think someone's trying to make a monkey out of us. Was your ancestor an ape-like creature? I don't think so. Let's talk about a few of the so-called cavemen. We could spend hours on this topic, but we got more to cover here. Uh, Nebraska man was used for years as evidence for evolution. All they found for a Nebraska man was one tooth. That is the entire Nebraska man right there. One tooth. Then they built an entire man from that one tooth and later made him a wife. Now, you have to really be good to know what his wife looks like from his tooth. Okay, but these are professionals. Don't question them, okay? They know what they're talking about. Later, they found out the tooth actually came from a pig. There's the real Nebraska man right there. How about Piltdown Man, named after the gravel pit it was found in in Piltdown, England. Somebody took a human skull and an ape's jaw. They filed them down and fooled everybody. In 1912, they discovered the Piltdown Man. It was in the New York Times. Darwin theory proved true from the Piltdown Man. It was going to be used in 1925 at the Scopes Monkey Trial as part of the evidence for evolution. 
But the judge said, the question is not, is there evidence for evolution? The question is, did he violate the law of teaching? So he was found guilty of breaking the law. The teacher was John T. Scopes down here in Dayton, Tennessee. But Piltdown Man was a hoax. Somebody had taken an ape's jawbone and a human skull, broke the uh, TMJs off, made them fit together, and fooled everybody, filed the teeth down. For 40 years, it was in the textbooks as proof for evolution. It was a fraud, exposed as a fraud, 1953. Neanderthal man is still in your textbooks, used in your town here in Knoxville, Tennessee. But it's been proven years ago, it cannot possibly be a missing link. Long story about the Neander Valley, named after Joachim Neander, that wrote the song in the songbook, Praise to the Lord, the Almighty, the King of Creation. Great godly man. Back in 1856, they found a skeleton petrified, a man petrified, in this valley called the Neander Valley, and they named it Neanderthal Man. The back was bent over. Well, apes walk on four legs and man walks on two, so when the Darwin's theory became popular, they resurrected the Neanderthal Man and said, oh, wow, maybe he's slowly evolved and he's coming up. Well, they've known from the very beginning it was an old man with arthritis who's slowly going down. He's not coming up at all. He's headed down, but they still keep him in the textbooks. About 300 Neanderthals have been found. Their brains are bigger than ours. Their bone structure was incredibly strong. They said they had so many muscles that the average Neanderthal could probably pick up the average NFL linebacker and fling him over the goalpost. Phenomenal strength in the Neanderthals. They gave the same skull to nine different artists and said, what did he look like in life? They got nine different answers. They said, what would you like him to look like? We're artists, you know, we can make him, you want him ape-like or human-like? You tell us what you want, we'll do it. Jack Cuazzo, a friend of mine from New Jersey, has been a dentist for 32 years. He came and spoke at our conference a few weeks ago at the boot camp we had <clears throat> in Pensacola. He studied the actual Neanderthal skulls in Europe. He said, these Neanderthals are just perfectly normal humans that are living to really great age. See, before the flood came, the people lived to be 900. After the flood, lifespans dropped off to 400, and then 200, and then 100. But that's still a long time to live. And it's a simple fact, the bones of your eyebrow ridge never stop growing. So if you could live to be three or 400 years old, your eyebrow ridge would stick way out. People today, they use their jaws a lot, like the Aborigines in Australia are always using their jaws as a vice. They don't carry a toolbox with them. Their eyebrow ridge sticks out really far because of the chewing muscles. It pulls on the bone. The Neanderthals are perfectly normal human that are living to be two or three hundred years old. That's all they are. Their brain's bigger than ours. They're not subhuman at all. They're just really old human. There's an aborigine on the far left over there. See the eyebrow ridge sticking out? That's from chewing or using your jaw muscles a lot. There are a lot of different shapes of head. You could line up the folks in Knoxville, Tennessee and prove evolution just by the shape of the skull. And drive downtown. You'll see what I'm talking about, okay? There's Cro-Magnon man, still used in the textbooks, yet it's perfectly normal human. Why on earth is that considered a missing link? They've got one in there called um, Homo sapien is modern man. He's listed as Cro-Magnon. It's not modern, it's not a missing link at all. One they've got in there now is called Australopithecus afarensis. That was proven wrong in 18, I mean in 1973. 30 years ago, proven wrong. Why are they keeping that in the textbooks as evidence for evolution? They've got Australopithecus africanus, or afarensis, better known as Lucy. How many have ever heard of Lucy before? Donald Johansson found Lucy in 1974, Ethiopia. He had gone there with a grant to look for missing links. Somebody gave him some money, said, here, go find a missing link. If you don't find one, no more money. Two weeks before his grant money expired, he discovered Lucy. Highly motivated, I suspect. And that would be a suspect, by the way, in a court of law, you know. Lucy was three feet tall. It was obviously a chimpanzee of some kind. Now, the bones of the skull were crushed thoroughly. Could not tell anything about the skull. But when they put it together for your kid's textbook, they can make it half human, half ape. They named it Lucy because they were listening to the song, Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds. Very popular back then, which, by the way, has the initials LSD, which they must have been on when they found this thing. But... Uh, the knee joint that was labeled Lucy's knee in National Pornographic, uh, Geographic was actually found a mile and a half away and 200 feet deeper. But National Geographic labeled it Lucy's knee. It's not Lucy's knee. It's a mile and a half away, for heaven's sake, okay? There's quite a controversy about that knee joint still. But this, the knee joint is the best evidence they have that Lucy was becoming a human. Because an ape has the lower and upper leg that are in a straight line with each other. A human leg goes up to your knee and angles off to the side because your hips are wider than your knees. 
Lucy's knee angled off to the side. The femur angled. And Donald said, see, that proves she's becoming a human. No, any monkey that climbs trees has an angled femur. What he found was a tree-climbing monkey. It's not proof it's becoming a human. He said, well, the bones are slightly bigger than a regular ape. Well, that's true. It doesn't prove it's becoming a human. The bones of a Clydesdale are slightly bigger than a regular horse. That doesn't prove it's becoming a truck, for heaven's sake, okay? What he found was a heavy-duty chimpanzee, and probably the pre-flood chimpanzees and everything was probably more heavy-duty. If they're living longer, much healthier, that's all he found. There are big horses and little horses today, by the way. St. Louis Zoo put human feet on their Lucy display. Not one foot bone or hand bone was found. Not one. Every other australopithecine that's been found has curled toes. Professor Menton at Washington University said, the statue is a complete misrepresentation. That's a big fancy word for lie. I prefer, I prefer smaller words. It's a lie. The zoo director said, zoo officials have no plans to knuckle under. We cannot be updating every exhibit based on every new piece of evidence. We look at the overall exhibit and the impression it creates, and we think this impression it creates is correct. Uh, Bruce, are you telling me you would lie to kids coming through your zoo just to get an impression across to them that evolution is true? You mean your theory is more important than the facts? That's exactly correct. They will lie to the kids going through these science centers and zoos to make them believe this evolution theory. And there are lies in the textbooks, like 60 of them. We cover that on video number four, lies in the textbooks. In Africa, they found perfectly normal human footprints in a layer of ash that had turned to stone. Perfectly normal human footprints. But the footprints were in ash, supposed to be three and three-quarter million years old. They studied the footprints and said, wow, these footprints are exactly the same as ours today. Russell Tuttle, University of Chicago, studied the footprints carefully. He went and found a place where people never wear shoes. They never wear shoes, ever. And he studied their footprints. He had them run through the mud, walk through the mud, you know, jog through the mud, trot, skip. He said the footprints of these people that never wear shoes are exactly like the footprints found in Laetoli, Africa. Identical. And then he said, if the Laetoli footprints were not known to be so old, we would conclude they were made by a member of our own genus. In other words, if we didn't know better, we would think a human made these. Well, how do you know better? Oh, because the rock is too old. This is an example of where the evolution theory is a hindrance to common sense and to scientific research. It's one of the greatest hindrances to science. It's not part of science. It's counterproductive to science. The National Geographic put human ape-like human ape mixture features on these uh, creatures walking through this ash. Now, keep in mind, not one bone was found. No bones are found. If you find perfectly normal human footprints, what would justify you putting dark-skinned, ape-like creatures walking there? on your drawing. And if I was African American, I'd get upset that they always use dark skin on the missing links. Like there's some kind of, you know, darker skin is less evolved. <laughs> That's what they're trying to imply here. And why did they add this toe separation? Notice the big toe is separated away from the rest of them on the picture. They did it on purpose because it's a real serious problem going from an ape-like foot to a human foot. Apes have a toe that sticks off to the side like a thumb. That's so they can grab a, tr a tree branch and hang by their back feet. You can't do that, okay? If you want to practice it, I'd suggest you start on a low branch for practice, okay? Because <laughs> you're going to hurt your head. But here they have four million years of bipedalism, and they gave every one of these so-called missing links human feet. Because the foot is a serious problem for the evolutionist. Charles Oxnard studied Lucy and said, the bones of Lucy represent an animal that is not in the line of humans. It's not a missing link. He did a computer multivariant analysis of the bones, okay? There could be these creatures, the little ape-like creatures that walk upright, still alive in Sumatra today. Lucy may represent an animal that is still alive. Peking man was used for years as evidence for evolution. Everything disappeared during World War II. But they found a cave with a bunch of crushed monkey skulls in there. The skull had been smashed, and they found a bunch of human tools. And so some brilliant scientist said, wow, these monkeys are learning to make tools. Oh, and they're practicing on their head. Yeah, <laughs> that's a good one. Let's keep that one right over here. Well, duh. They didn't tell anybody. They found 10 normal humans in the same cave, skeletons of humans. See, in some cultures, they like to eat monkey brains. You ever seen Indiana Jones? Mm -hmm. 
They just found a cave where they were eating monkeys. That's where they had their feasts or something. It's not a missing link. Homo erectus is still in the textbooks. Homo erectus used to be called Java man. Then they changed it to Pithecanthropus erectus and now called Homo erectus. It was found by Dr. Dubois, a Dutch anatomist, who went to Indonesia purposely to try to find missing links. He hired a bunch of prison convicts to go dig for him. He wasn't even there when they found it. What they found was an ape's skull cap, three human teeth, and a thigh bone found a year later, 50 feet away. Dubois, Dubois put them all together and said, we have a missing link here. You don't even know those animal bones go together. Three teeth, thigh bone, and a skull cap from an ape. This was also going to be used in 1925 as evidence for evolution at the Scopes Monkey Trial. The Java Man. The famous anatomist uh, Virchow said, In my opinion, this creature is, a, is an animal, a giant gibbon. In fact, the thigh bone has not the slightest connection with the skull. Dubois hid the fact that he found two human skulls in the same area. He put those under his bed under the floor. Like Edgar Allan Poe, you know, Telltale Heart, only this was Telltale Head. But there's no evidence of how man evolved at all. The evidence for evolution for uh, humans is fragmentary. Fossil evidence of chimpanzee evolution is absent altogether. There is no evidence of how chimpanzees evolved. But yet you have articles in the magazines all the time, you know, about evolution. Where are we going? I can tell you that. You're going straight to hell if you don't accept Christ. It's real simple. That's a no-brainer. In Skull, they were going to have a big display of the Orc Man. Orce, O-R-C-E, the Orce Man. They were going to put the, have a big you know, party for the Orce Man they discovered until they discovered it's actually a piece of a skull fragment from a donkey four months old. That was going to be the missing link. A dolphin's rib had been labeled as human collarbone in the museum for a long time. So somebody said, oh, that's a dolphin's rib. That's not a human collarbone. The Hobbit was just found here in 19, or 2004. The Hobbit was a little bitty, tiny human, probably a result of uh, secondary microcephaly dwarfism. Just a normal human, about three and a half feet tall. There are people like that today running around the planet. Okay? There's a good book on the so-called cavemen, if you want to read this. If you're being taught this in school, get the book by Marvin Lubinow, Bones of Contention. Excellent book. It'll really put everything into perspective for you. The only missing link I can find is up between these guys' ears. You know, something is missing. Somebody's professors spend all their free time digging in the dirt looking for bones. My dog does the same thing. But we don't make the taxpayers pay his salary while he does it, okay? Now, most states have laws requiring textbooks to be accurate. Florida has one. California has one. Texas has one. Wisconsin has one. Alabama has one. The law says textbooks should be accurate. Minnesota says, teachers shall not deliberately suppress or distort subject matter. But Minnesota textbooks are still teaching all these as evidence for evolution. When they, all the ones in the red circle have been proven, they cannot possibly be a missing link. By the way, the Minnesota textbook, and most textbooks now, instead of calling man Homo sapien, like we used to be called, they're now called Homo sapien sapien. Wow, what's that mean? Well, sapien means wise. So we're the wise, wise man. See, the Bible says, professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. And if you think your grandpa swung by his tail from a tree, you're a fool. Plain and simple, okay? This textbook says, he's the daddy of us all. Oh, that's silly. You don't know he's the daddy of anybody. You find bones in the dirt, you don't know it's the daddy of anybody. It's just the mother of all mammals from the Smithsonian. If you find bones, you don't know it's the mother of anything. See, if you find fossil in the dirt, all you know is it died. You couldn't prove it had any kids, and you sure couldn't prove it had different kids. And why would you think a bone you found in the dirt can do something animals today cannot do, which is produce something other than their kind? No fossil would count as evidence in a court of law, as evidence for evolution in a court of law. So where does a stone age fit into the Bible? Was there ever a stone age? Well, right after the flood, Noah couldn't tell his grandson to go to the hardware store and get him a shovel. There were no hardware stores. They had a devastated society, folks. They got off the ark and everything outside is destroyed. You have to totally rebuild civilization. They had a Gilligan's Island situation. You got a bunch of smart people. Well, Gilligan's Island did not have a bunch of smart people. You know, maybe one. But they're on this d devastated planet. So they're going to have to rebuild from scratch and you're going to make stone tools because that's much quicker than digging the iron ore out, smelting it down, and making an iron tool. 
you know, by the time it takes you three weeks to make your axe, you're going to starve to death, okay? So they're going to make stone tools. And people that are driven out of society are going to travel around in small herds and packs following, uh, following uh, migrating animals, and they don't want to carry 50 pounds worth of stone tools with them. It's quicker to make your stone tools on the job site. You follow the mammoths until you catch up with them or the buffalo, and then you quick make your tools, kill the buffalo or the mammoth, and you butcher it and leave your tools behind and go on someplace else. And then we today find these stone tools and say, wow, look at this Clovis point. Wow, perfectly shaped, perfectly balanced. This guy is smart. This is an advanced civilization. And then they find another arrowhead that looks kind of crude, you know, it's not chipped very smoothly. And they say, wow, this guy's pre-human. You're not quite as smart. You know, maybe you got the whole wrong perspective on that. Maybe the one that looks kind of crude was found by a guy who's in a bigger hurry because the mammoth is getting away, okay? He just doesn't have time to sit there and play with his arrowhead for an hour. He wants to go shoot the thing now before it runs off. So it might be an example of how much time they have to spend on it. Not at all an example of their intelligence, all right? But not only were people living longer before the flood, animals were too, and they were growing bigger, probably much bigger. Here's a hornless rhinoceros, 18 feet tall. That's a big rhino. People say, that's a prehistoric animal. No, did you know the word prehistoric was not even in the dictionary until about 100 years ago? We collect old dictionaries in our science center. If you have some old dictionaries from 17 or 1800s, we'd love to get them. I got a dictionary from 1766. The word prehistoric was not there. I got a dictionary from 1860. The word prehistoric is not there. No such thing as prehistoric back in 1860. Here's a dictionary from 1892. The word prehistoric is still not there. See, there are things that are pre-flood, but there's no such thing as prehistoric. We have history from the first day. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. You can't go before that. So there's no such thing as prehistoric. But before the flood came, this canopy of water would increase air pressure which would make things behave very differently. It makes insects grow much bigger. See, insects are limited on size by based on the amount of oxygen they can get. Insects that live in oxygen-rich waters get a thousand times heavier than those that don't. It has to do with the surface area to volume ratio. Without boring everybody for a half hour, the larger an insect gets, it has more skin, but not compared to its volume. The surface area compared to its volume ratio drops off, as you can see on the chart here. So as an insect gets larger, it can't, doesn't have enough skin because insects breathe through their skin. But giant insect fossils have been found, like this dragonfly with a 50-inch wingspan. How'd you like to hit one of those at 70 miles an hour? <laughs> you take the bug deflector and the hood right off and join you in the front seat. Big dragonflies have been found fossilized on this planet. Today they get four or five inches long, you know, not very big. Pre-flood, they were huge. Cockroaches get pretty good size today. We raise them in our museum in Pensacola, the Madagascar hissing cockroaches. But did you know giant cockroaches have been found, 18-inch long cockroach fossils? <laughs> you didn't call Orkin in those days. You called the National Guard to come exterminate the house, okay? Giant fossil centipede, eight and a half feet long, was found. Grasshoppers two feet long have been found fossilized. You can make a meal out of those. Tarantula with a three-foot leg span fossil. 60-foot cattail fossils have been found. A donkey nine feet high. From Texas, of course. Everything's bigger in Texas. Okay. Giant sloths obviously lived on the planet. Now, you're going to be told that was millions of years ago. No, it wasn't. It was just before the flood came. Buffalo were found with horn spans up to 12 feet Elk with 12-foot antlers. Some of you deer hunters are thinking, wow, that'll look good on the wall. How many of you go out and try to shoot Bambi's daddy? Come on, be honest, okay? There we go, good, good. And eat them too. You know, fossil kangaroos have been found 10 feet tall. And fossil wombat, the size of a mini. There's a fossil of a guinea pig that was 1,500 pounds. That's a big guinea pig. Birds have been found 13 feet tall. There's an uh, elephant bird egg. The one behind it's an ostrich egg, which is also huge. <laughs> they find fossils of prehistoric goose that stood as tall as an elephant and weighed half a ton. How'd you like to have that for Thanksgiving dinner? Tell Tiny Tim about that goose. <laughs> yeah. 
Fossil beavers have been found eight feet long. Here's a guy holding a beaver jaw from about a seven or eight foot beaver. There's a six foot beaver found in Ohio. See, if you have bigger trees before the flood, you would need bigger beavers to chew them down. Mm -hmm. God kept everything balanced in those days. Salamanders today get from five to eight inches long, typically. Did you know fossil salamanders have been found that are six feet long? Increasing air pressure means more gas gets into the water, and fish have to breathe in the water through their gills. So if you had more gas dissolved in the water from greater air pressure, now the fish can get bigger. And you can get a lot more fish per cubic mile. Today, if a shark has a tooth about an inch long, it indicates the shark was probably about 15 feet long. Did you know fossil sharks' teeth are found indicating sharks used to get 80 feet long on this planet? Can you imagine an 80-foot shark? The movie Jaws had a 25-foot shark. You'd have to use Jaws for bait to catch one of these megalodons. Dr. Baugh is raising piranha in an aquarium with a stronger magnetic field around it. Just increasing the magnetic field is doing something because his piranha are four times larger than normal. When he raised fruit flies in a hyperbaric chamber, they lived 10 times longer than normal just by increasing air pressure. If you combine the air pressure and the filtered sunlight and the stronger magnetic field, you'd probably get Garden of Eden conditions. They probably lost at least those things, maybe, maybe, at least those three things. Maybe more uh, things have been lost since then. Turtles got pretty good size. That's a big turtle uh, on the left. Oysters were found two miles above sea level. 11 foot oysters weighing 600 pounds two miles above sea level in the Andes Mountains. When they climbed Mount Everest, they found petrified clams on top of Mount Everest. Interesting thing about these clams, they're petrified and they're closed. Now, I'd like to point out, Mount Everest is a little ways from the beach, first of all, okay? About 450 miles to the beach. And clams do not climb mountains very well. And when a clam dies, it opens. You can walk along the beach and find a million seashells. You hardly ever find a matched pair. And you never find them closed if they're dead. They open right away. How do you get petrified closed clams on top of Mount Everest? Uh, I think there was a flood. But I don't think the flood was over Mount Everest. Mount Everest wasn't there. Psalm 104 tells us the mountains arose during the last part of the flood. The mountain ranges formed during the end of the flood, probably as a result of the earth's crust being cracked open and busted up into pieces, and pieces would lift up and flex back and forth. We cover all that on video number six. Reptiles never stop growing. It's a simple fact. Most reptiles never stop growing. They grow all their life. People stop growing. When you're 16 or 18, you're going to quit growing, at least vertically. Some go horizontally thereafter, but reptiles never stop growing. What would happen to a reptile if you put him in the Garden of Eden and let him live to be 900 years old? You'd have a big lizard. A really big lizard. Dinosaurs were big lizards that lived with Adam and Eve before the flood came. You can get these Jackson chameleons right now at the pet store. What's he going to look like at about 15 tons? Probably some kind of triceratops. Dinosaur means terrible lizard, and dinosaurs lived with humans all through history. They just had a different name for them. We'll cover more on dinosaurs on video number three. But dinosaur bones and human bones have been found together. Dinosaur bones were found in the same rock strata as these fossilized human hands. Dinosaur bones and mammal bones found together. <clears throat> Here's one of the Ica stones showing a human riding a dinosaur. Dr. Baugh has a couple of the stones in his museum. We have eight in our museum now of these Ica stones. I think we have the largest collection in America of these Ica stones from Peru. <clears throat> Many of them show dinosaurs on there. Cover more on that on seminar part three about dinosaurs in the Bible. Dinosaur footprints and human footprints have been found together in Glen Rose, Texas. I know there's controversy about this. I've been there five times. I've heard all the critics on it, and I've been there myself to check it out. Okay, But go to Dallas, Texas, and go south 45 miles to Glen Rose, and you'll find the Paluxy River flows through this little town, and it's all full of limestone. The whole area is limestone, kind of like around here in Knoxville. Well, that river cuts through this limestone layers. In 1908, there was a flood. 
17, uh, the river dropped 17 feet per mile, but this flood was incredible. It was, I think, 30 feet above flood stage or something. It was just an incredible flood in 1908. It ripped off the bottom of the river, tore off the layer of limestone. Two foot of limestone was ripped up. Underneath was a new layer of limestone, and when the river dried up that next summer, they discovered there are hundreds of dinosaur footprints. Dinosaur footprints. It's called Dinosaur Valley State Park. There's a book on the table uh, right there, if you want to read more about it. They chiseled out lots of the footprints and took them to museums to save them so they wouldn't get eroded by the river. Took out huge blocks in the 1930s and set them up under dinosaur skeletons. Footprints are big. Here's a, guy, here's a little kid taking a bath in one. But sometimes in, these, in this area they find human footprints with the dinosaur footprints. Human tracks and dinosaur tracks together. We could spend all day talking about this. There's been thousands of uh, reports on this thing made. Some believe it, some don't believe it. Uh, here's a trail of human tracks and crossing a trail of dinosaur tracks. And the human footprints, some of them are pretty good size, and occasionally they're found inside the dinosaur footprint. Well, if you're running through the mud to go escape the flood, that's the logical place to step, right where somebody else already stepped, like just like walking through deep snow. And I think a lot of people get the wrong idea. They think Noah got in the ark, the rain started, and everybody died in the first 10 minutes. It probably took six months to kill everybody on this planet. They'd be running, looking for high ground. The water kept coming up. See, the rain was 40 days, but the water said, the Bible says, the water kept coming up for 150 days because most of the water is coming from inside the crust of the earth, up through the fountains of the deep. The flood, the, the rain did almost nothing for the flood. It was water from inside that caused the flood. It probably took six months to kill everybody. So they'd be running, you know, when the tide goes down, they'd run to higher ground, and pretty soon they'd become fighting, they'd be fighting for this higher ground, which is becoming more and more scarce. But the footprints are pretty good size. We sell castings of this one if you want to get one. It's on our website, Dr. Dino. You can see the size uh, 24 human footprint. We had a kid try to fill it up one time, couldn't quite do it. Had a size 18. They chiseled out rock ledges and found more footprints underneath the undisturbed limestone. One of the footprints was sawn across the toes. They looked at it end grain, and you can see where it squeezed down and distorted the lamination lines. I know there's arguments about it. I've read, I think, everything on, it, on the topic. Sure read a lot, but I, I'm very convinced they're legitimate. The footprints have a six to seven foot stride. This would take a big man to be stepping six or seven feet every time. A friend of mine was down there when they were digging out the footprints. He wrote me this letter. He's now an assistant pastor at a Southern Baptist church in Arizona. He said, Dr. Hoven, I grew up in Glen Rose. I was on an excavation with Dr. Carl Ball. We followed the footprints of a man beside a dinosaur's footprints. It was as if the man were walking with the dinosaur. Nova was there to film the dig. There was also an evolutionist who was arguing with Dr. Ball the entire time. Nova didn't film much of the tracks or our dig, but they did interview the evolutionist. He told them he had not seen anything there to disprove evolution. What he didn't tell the camera was he had refused to turn around and look at the tracks we were working on. When they found one, they would tap him on the shoulder and say, uh, Sir, you want to look at this? He'd say, No, I don't want to see it. He stood with his back to the dig and the tracks while making these statements. Nova knew the man had not looked at the tracks, but they didn't report that. See, Nova apparently is committed to a theory called evolution. And anything that goes against the theory is just simply not going to be aired on TV. Period. The theory has to be protected from criticism. One guy said, well, if they find human footprints with dinosaur footprints, all that proves is that there was a dinosaur with feet like a human. Well, now that's just a brilliant way to look at it, isn't it? Another example where the evolution theory is a hindrance to research. Well, creationists state that humans and dinosaurs were contemporaneous in time. Were this momentous statement true, and the names of its discoverers would thunder down the corridors of time as individuals who made one of the most outstanding discoveries of the 20th century. Well, unless there's a media blockout, that's true. Okay? There are plenty of good books about that. But also they found a hammer, a fossilized human hammer, a man-made hammer. People say they didn't have any iron before the flood. Oh, sure they did. The Bible says Tubalcain was an artificer in brass and iron. You can get a replica of the hammer if you want to keep that on your desk. Check our catalog, drdino.com, or our website, drdino.com. This bell found inside a lump of coal. They knew about iron and metals before the flood came. They were extremely smart. You kids will be taught in school that the geologic column represents the history of the earth and that the Carboniferous era is when coal formed. That's baloney. 
coal formed at the time of the flood because that world was buried, okay? They found a gold chain inside a lump of coal back in 1881 in Illinois. This iron pot found inside a lump of coal. This thing found inside solid rock, supposed to be 600 million years old. Here I am in Nampa, Idaho, holding what's called the Nampa image. A well driller found this little doll 320 feet down while he's drilling a well. Probably a pre-flood doll. This uh, battery thing was found in Iraq, supposed to be a 2,000-year-old battery. They knew about electricity a long time ago. The Egyptians knew about electricity and knew how to electroplate things. Workers found human bones in a copper arrowhead in a vein of silver. Advanced stone tools were found in a gold mine in California. They're digging in the middle of this mountain, digging a shaft back into a gravel pit under layers of lava supposed to be 55 million years old, and they find human tools in there. Professor Holmes of the Smithsonian was one of the most vocal critics of the California finds. He said, perhaps if Professor Whitney had fully appreciated the story of human evolution, as it is understood today, he would have hesitated to announce the conclusions, notwithstanding the imposing array of testimony. Is he saying he shouldn't have announced this finding because it goes against the theory? Is that what he's saying? <laughs> That's exactly what he's saying. And folks, I'm telling you, there are people that are so dedicated to that stupid evolution theory that they will block out from their mind and from print, if they can, anything that goes against it. They defend the theory with religi religious fervor. Smithsonian is very responsible for doing a lot of this stuff of hiding evidence against evolution. In 1950s, Thomas Lee from the National Museum of Canada found advanced stone tools in a gravel deposit. <coughs> the problem was the gravel deposit had been dated at... <coughs> 65 to 125,000 years old, which is way too old for humans to be in Canada. So the director of the museum was fired for refusing to fire the discoverer. Tons of artifacts disappeared into storage bins. The discovery had to be killed. It would have forced the rewriting of almost every book in the business. We can't have you find something that goes against our theory because all of the books we've printed talk about how wonderful the theory is, and now you're going to make us rewrite all these books, so you're fired. This coin was found by a well driller in Illinois, over 100 feet below the surface, never was analyzed. The flood buried that world. God not only told him what to do and how to live before the flood, he also told him what to eat. He gave him a perfect diet. God said, I want you to eat the herbs, kids, eat your vegetables, the fruit, and the seeds. Genesis 1.29. We don't do that much. We eat the hamburger, french fries, and coke. God said, eat the fruit, vegetables, and seeds. When you eat the fruit, you should eat the seed. When you eat a peach, eat the seed. You say, that thing's hard. Well, crack it open with a hammer. The seed is inside the hull, okay? And by the way, there's a good book. A lady saw my seminar, got all excited, went on a Garden of Eden diet, and totally revolutionized her health, and wrote a good book on that, following the Eden diet. If you want to get that, you're right to be beautiful. But to... You should eat the seed. Now, be sure to get organically grown seeds, not the ones raised on steroids and pesticides. But the seeds contain a bitter substance called cyanide that will give you a pucker that will last about an hour and a half. Some of you old-timers are looking at me like, uh, pucker, pucker, what is that for? Man, I used to know. My dad says, you know you're getting old when you get all the way across the room to give your wife a kiss and then you forgot why you came. Yep, you're getting old, Dad. <laughs> but these seeds contain a vitamin called vitamin B17, which is half cyanide. You say, oh, that's poison. No, oh, it's not either. Hydrogen's explosive. Ask the folks on the Hindenburg, they found out. And oxygen supports combustion. Now, who in their right mind would spray hydrogen and oxygen on a fire to try to put it out? Every fireman on the planet. What do you get if you mix hydrogen and oxygen? water. Okay? Sodium is poisonous. Chlorine is poisonous. You mix them together, you get salt, which is perfectly wonderful. So the cyanide found in the seeds is mixed with benzaldehyde. Both are poison, but together they're harmless until they bump into a cancer cell. There's a book about this topic called World Without Cancer. Plenty of websites about that topic. If you want to read more, there's a bunch of stuff there on the screen and on my website, drdino.com. There's a tribe of folks in northern Pakistan called the Hunza. The Hunza people never get cancer. When the tribe was first discovered, their average age was 160. 
This is one of the valleys up there in the Himalaya Mountains. This led to the legend of Shangri-La. How many have ever heard of the Valley of Shangri-La, the valley where you live forever? Well, they didn't live forever, but they lived an awfully long time. The Hunza people's favorite food to eat is apricot seeds. Now, today they typically live to be about 90. They've had a lot of contact with the outside world. But apricot seeds are kind of interesting. They take the apricot seeds and squeeze them and get oil out of them. They put the oil on their skin and the women don't wrinkle. They're really good looking at 70 and 80. Hunzas eat these apricot seeds like we eat peanuts. They just love them. And they never get cancer. You know, people that take nutritional therapy to cure cancer have a much better survival rate. Now, they don't all still survive, I understand, okay? But it's about 10 times the opportunity to live than it is from taking the conventional therapies. There's plenty of good books on this topic. Jason Vale uh, teaches you should eat apricot seeds to cure cancer. And he said, cancer cannot survive in a body of a person that consumes apricot seeds. Jason Vale simply recommended that people eat apricot seeds, and they arrested him and put him in jail. He's still in jail now for telling people to eat apricot seeds. Because the FDA wants people to take drugs to get well, not seeds to get well, because they can't regulate seeds. They can't make money off of it. It all goes back to money. You know, follow the yellow brick road, uh, the money trail. For years, sailors died of a horrible disease called scurvy. The British Navy lost a million sailors to scurvy. Does anybody know how they cured scurvy? Vitamin C. They didn't even know about vitamin C. They just knew if you eat limes, you don't get it. They called them the limeys, didn't they? Take vitamin, take, take limes on board. Many diseases that we get today are caused by a deficiency of a vitamin. It's not what you're eating that's killing you. It's what you're not eating that's killing you. If you don't get enough berry, uh, vitamin B, you get beriberi, pellagra, rickets. All those are vitamin deficiency diseases. The Bible says God gave herb for the service of man and bread to strengthen man's heart. Did you know bread used to strengthen your heart? But keep in mind, you know, the love of money, root of all evil. They learned years ago, if they take out the vitamin E, the lecithin, and the omega-3 fatty acids, they take them out of the wheat, make the bread with white flour, the bread lasts for months. But the people started dying of heart attacks and strokes and circulation problems. See, it's a simple formula. The whiter the bread, the quicker you're dead. <clears throat> now, it's not the white bread that's killing you. It's what's not in the bread that's killing you. See, God made bread to strengthen your heart. And if you eat, the, remember the Bible talked about our daily bread? But people who were making bread to sell got tired of having half of it go bad on the shelf where they couldn't sell it. So they had to figure out a way to make the bread last longer to increase profits. It all goes back to money. Follow the yellow brick road. There are two philosophies of health. One is based upon evolution, which says your body is nothing but chemicals that got together by chance over billions of years. So you, to treat diseases, you add more chemicals. It's called drug therapy. If you have a headache, you say, Doctor, I have a headache. He says, Here, take an aspirin. Well, now hold on a minute. What caused your headache? Was it the lack of an aspirin that caused your headache? Are you suffering from an aspirin deficiency? Aren't you treating the symptom instead of the cause? I mean, think about it. See, if you're driving down the highway and the oil light comes on your car, you've got two choices. Find the problem and fix it, or unplug the light. You say, you would never unplug the light. That'd be stupid. Yes, I know that'd be stupid. The light's not the problem. The light's trying to tell you about a problem. And believe it or not, your headache is not your problem. Your headache's trying to tell you about a problem. Deficiency in magnesium, maybe, or protein, I don't know. But most of the drugs that we take today are to unplug lights. They're not to fix problems. They're to fix symptoms. And sometimes that's necessary. I'm not against drugs all the time, but I'm telling you folks, we've gone nuts. Drug companies don't make money when you're well. And the love of money is the root of all evil. Most diseases are deficiency diseases. You're low in a vitamin or a mineral or an oil. There are 16 vitamins, 60 minerals, and 3 oils your body needs every day. Just give it plenty, okay? There's a good book by Bill Sardi, a friend of mine in California, called The Power of Healing, The Power of God. We're out of it on the table, but you can order that if you want to study more on health. Or get his other book, The Bible Prescription for Health and Longevity. 
uh, by Bill Sardi. And before you get excited about them putting fluoride in your water, you might want to read about the truth behind fluoride that they add to our water systems and how dangerous that is. Back in 1845, a doctor in Vienna, Austria, was horrified because 30% of the women giving birth in the hospital died. 30%. So this doctor noted that the doctors would examine the bodies of the women who died and then, without washing their hands, go examine the next expectant mother. They didn't know about microscopic organisms back then. But Dr. Siemowice insisted the doctors in his hospital wash their hands after examining a dead body. The death rate dropped to 2%. Anybody know what happened to Dr. Siemowice because of his great discovery? He was fired. Three hospitals in a row fired him. Finally, he ended up in a mental institution where a patient murdered him. Just for insisting you wash your hands, 3,000 years earlier, in the book of Leviticus, God had told Moses, tell the people when you touch a dead body, you are unclean and wash your hands and your body before you touch anybody else. God said that 3,000 years before science figured it out. The other philosophy of medicine is based upon creation, which says your body is designed by God and he gave us the food to meet our needs, vitamins, minerals, etc. It's called nutrition therapy. We have much more on that on our video series called The Bible and Health, if you want to get a whole lot more on that topic. See, the average number of people that die every year from taking herbs is zero. Every year, about three people die from taking vitamins. Every year, about 320 people die from taking over-the-counter drugs. About 9,000 people die from foodborne illnesses. And every year, 90 to 110,000 people die from taking correctly prescribed drugs. This is not counting the incorrectly prescribed. This is those that you, they told you to take, and you took it and you died. Twice as many as died in the Vietnam War in 10 years die every year from taking correctly prescribed drugs. There are also two philosophies of government. We get into more of this on video five, but one's based on evolution, which says laws come from man's opinion, the rights are granted by the government, and the government should be the all-powerful provider with welfare and everything else. It's called a democracy. Democracies are dangerous forms of government. They always become dictatorships. And they always talk about this, you know, universal health care. Well, 70 to 80 percent of all health care costs in America are from self-induced problems. If you want to take drugs and drink alcohol and smoke, that's your business. But if you want me to pay for it when you get sick, that's my business. If we're going to have universal health care, why don't we have universal auto care? I mean, if you run your car into a tree, the government help, buys, you, buys you a new car. You back into somebody in the parking lot and scratch it, hey, that's okay, the government will fix it. You blow up your engine because you forgot to change oil, that's okay, the government will fix it. Why don't we have universal house care? See, if you've ever owned a house and rented it out to somebody else, you will understand. How many know what I'm talking about? Renters just don't look at it the same way owners do, do they? And when it's your responsibility to take care of your health, you'll take care of it. And when you bought the car, you won't back it into a tree and laugh about it. <laughs> you'll cry when you hit the tree. The other philosophy of, of government is based on creation, which says laws come from the Creator, rights are unalienable, and the government should be limited. It's called a republic. More on that on video number five. <clears throat> we could talk about that for two hours. Genesis 1.30, and we'll quit here. God said to every beast of the earth, to every fowl of the air, and everything that creepeth upon the earth, when there is life, I have given green herb. You mean everything that lived on earth ate plants before the flood came? That's exactly right. You say, Brother Hovind, look at those teeth. Now that's a meat eater. No, that's a panda bear. You know, sharp teeth do not indicate meat eating. There's a deer in China. It's called the water deer. You can look it up on the internet. Water deer. Has teeth like a saber-toothed tiger. <laughs> you look at a saber-toothed. Oh, wow, that's a meat eater. No, that's a vegetarian, okay? How about that one? Now, that's a meat eater. Look at those sharp teeth, Hovind. No, nope, sorry, that's a fruit bat. How about that one? That's a meat eater. No, that's a vegetarian monkey. There's a lion that refused to eat meat all of its life, lived to be 11 years old. It was used in movies as an actor, finally got killed in an accident on the movie set. 
refuse to eat meat of any kind. After the flood's over, Genesis 9, God blessed Noah and the boys and said, Go have a bunch of kids. And boy, they did too. Here we are. He said, And the fear of you and the dread of you shall be upon every beast of the earth. You know, the first change after the flood, animals became afraid of man. They weren't afraid before. Now they became afraid of man. Second change after the flood, God said, Noah, every moving thing that liveth shall be meat for you. Now you can eat meat. And because of that, there's a lot of suffering in the world. Animals suffer so we can eat, and it's perfectly fine to eat meat. But God made a perfect world, and man destroyed it. Man brought death and sin into this world. Paul said, for I reckon, that proves he's a southerner, that the sufferings of this present time, is there suffering in the world today? <sighs> Lots of it. The whole world's filled with groaning and travailing and pain. Charlie Darwin said, I'm bewildered. I had no intention to write atheistically. But there seems to be so much misery in the world. Charlie couldn't understand why God made a world with suffering. Charlie, God didn't make a world with suffering. But Charlie Darwin thought, from the war of famine and nature and death, famine, war of nature was from famine and death, the most exalted object we're capable of conceiving. Wait a minute. Charlie, are you saying that war and famine and death is what exalts us to a higher level? That's exactly what he says, and that's exactly what evolution teaches today. Nothing's changed. Death is the hero of the plot for the evolutionist. The Bible says God made a perfect world. Man wrecked it. By one man, sin came into the world, and death by sin. It was Adam's fault. You can't blame a wrecked car on the manufacturer. Send a picture to the manufacturer of a wreck and say, hey, why did you build a car like this? <laughs> it didn't look like this when it left the factory. Today, folks, we are living in a junkyard. Now, I like living on planet Earth, and Knoxville's a beautiful place, but I'm telling you, folks, this is nothing compared to what Adam and Eve saw. This is a junkyard, but God's going to fix it back. Someday the wolf shall dwell with the lamb, the leopard shall lie down with the kid and the calf and the young lion and a fatling together, and a little child shall lead them. A little child's going to lead a leopard or a lion? Hey, Mommy, look at the big kitty I found. Can I keep the kitty, Mommy? Sure, honey, put the big kitty in the backyard and give her some grass. He said, Hoven, lions don't eat grass. Oh, they will one day. The lion shall eat straw like the ox. A guy in Canada sent me a video clip of bears in his yard eating grass for two hours straight. Just nothing but grass. The Bible says the child shall die a hundred years old. They're going to rule and reign with Christ for a thousand years. Now, there's not, a whole lot, not, not enough scripture to be real dogmatic, but it appears that there's going to be a thousand year span coming after the end of this age when if you're saved, you're going to get to live here for a thousand years. With everything fixed back, Garden of Eden conditions. Kids, you're going to get to have your own pet dinosaurs. That's going to be cool. Then he's going to make new heavens and a new earth. Isaiah 65, 2 Peter 3. New heavens, new earth. Revelation 21, new heaven, new earth. You can't even imagine what that's going to be like. I sure can't. The Bible says, I have not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. God has things planned for his kids that you can't even think about. I'm going to give you one to try to think about, and then we'll quit, go get some lunch. This is the electromagnetic spectrum. <clears throat> I taught physics. I've got to get this in here somewhere. This contains all the different wavelengths, radio waves, microwaves, including a little bitty slice called light, the color spectrum, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet. Your eyeball is able to see those colors, but that's only a small piece of a huge spectrum. Suppose God gives us new eyes when we get to heaven, and we're able to see the entire spectrum. That means there'll be brand new colors. Not new shades of these colors. I'm talking brand new colors. That's why heaven has to be so large. It's for the women's closets. <laughs> My wife's going to say, Honey, does this go with this? I'll say, Dear, I couldn't figure it out back on earth. She has to number my ties to go with my suits because I don't know what goes with what. Secondly, I don't care. I just want to get dressed. Would you lay it out, please? 
Anybody else feel that way about it? Say, I don't know what goes with what. Just put it together for me. Amen. <laughs> there you go. Your mom or your wife says, that doesn't match. Well, how am I supposed to know? You know, where's the rule book on that? Huh? <laughs> hey, suppose we get to heaven and God gives us new eyes that can see the whole spectrum and we'll be able to see the sounds coming off the musical instruments. Right now we can only hear them. What if you could see them? Or smell them? Ah, C major diminished. Play it again. Ah. What if we get new ears that can hear the whole spectrum? What if you can hear the colors? Or smell them? Or taste them? Ah, blue. Wow. We've only got five senses, folks. Maybe there are more. But if God just took these five and expanded them to the max, we would spend forever walking around heaven going, wow, have you smelled that? Lick that. Wow. <laughs> My first computer was an IBM XT8088, 4.77 megahertz. When you told it to load a program, you might as well go get lunch and open the mail and take a nap because it's going to be a while. How many had one of those old time computers? We've upgraded. My computer sitting here now is a Pentium 4, 3.4 gigahertz with hyper-threading, 60 gig hard drive, 2 gig of RAM. The same programs run, but they're much faster. And they're in color. That's called a systems upgrade. Did you know if you like living in your body with the sights and sounds and tastes of this world, wait till you get to heaven. You're headed for a systems upgrade that's going to blow your mind. The only question is, are you going? Paul said, I knew a man in Christ 14 years ago who was caught up to the third heaven. I think he's talking about himself. I think he actually died and was caught up to the third heaven. And he heard things that were unspeakable. You can't even explain it. Hey, could you explain colors to a blind man? Try it sometime. Can you explain sounds to a deaf person? Just try that sometime. Can you explain heaven to an earthling? can't be done. You couldn't understand it beyond your capabilities. But boy, for the rest of his life, when Paul came back down, he was anxious to go back to heaven. He told the Philippians, I've got a desire to depart and be with Christ, but I'll stay here because you need me. Paul would go to town preaching and they'd say, Paul, if you don't knock off that preaching, we're going to kill you. Really? <laughs> Give me your best shot, man. Let's go. He was anxious to go. How about you? You ready to go? God made this world. He owns it. He makes the rules, and we all broke His rules. He told us real clearly, Thou shalt not bear false witness. Don't lie. We've all lied. He told us, Don't steal. We've all stolen. You can read, and that's only 10. There's over 600 commandments in the Old Testament. That's only 10. We've broken a lot of them, folks. There's no question. We are guilty, and we're going to be punished. Or we need to find a substitute. That's where Jesus comes in. He's willing and able to substitute for your sins. And February 9th, 1969, I said, Lord, I am a sinner and I deserve to go straight to hell, but I believe you died for me and I'd like you to forgive me. I want you to pay for my sins, Lord. I'm sorry. I have broken your rule. I am hopelessly, helplessly lost. But I believe you can fix it. Please save me. The Bible says, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Romans 10, 13. So that day I called on the Lord and gave my heart to Him, and He saved me. And today, if I, go to, if I die, I'm going to heaven. It's not because I'm good. Are you kidding? If I get what I deserve, I'm in trouble. And you are too. The preacher was down praying with the deacon one time, and the preacher took off down, running, running down the aisle, whoo, racing out the back door. And somebody stopped him and said, Preacher, preacher, where are you going? He said, i got to get out of here. He said, Why? Why, preacher? He said, I was down there praying with the deacon. Yeah, so what? That deacon was praying. He said, Lord, just give me what I deserve. I don't want to be close when he gets it, man. I'm getting out of here. <laughs> man, I don't want what I deserve. I want God's mercy. <laughs> Have you got that? If you die today, where would you go? Smoking or non-smoking? You're going to be dead for a really long time. You better think about that one. Now, if you're saved... What on earth are you doing for heaven's sake? What are you doing for the Lord? Kids, you can go to sleep. You won't understand this, but parents, you'll understand this. Mom can wash the clothes, dry them, fold them, and set them by the bedroom door. 
the kid comes in and doesn't even see him. How many know what I'm talking about? It's like, uh, didn't you see those clothes? Uh-uh. <laughs> I think God's up in heaven looking down at some of his, some of his kids saying, uh, don't you see what needs to be done? You know, hello, do something. You know, pass out a gospel track, get somebody saved, you know, start a Sunday school class, do something. What are you doing for the Lord? We hope you've enjoyed this video series on creation, evolution, and dinosaurs. Much more important, though, than knowing all the truth and facts about science is to know the truth about whether you're going to heaven or not. If you've never trusted Christ as your Savior, uh, let me explain quickly what you need to do to go to heaven. The Bible says we're all sinners. We've all broken God's laws. We've disobeyed the Creator. We've, we've done wicked things. We're sinners. Some are worse than others, at least in man's eyes, but we've all broken God's laws. And the Bible says you have to repent. The word repent means to turn. It actually means two things, to turn from your sin and to turn to God. God's looking for a change in your attitude where you say, Lord, I don't want to do wrong anymore. I'm sorry, I've offended you. I want to do right. And you turn from sin and you turn to God and say, God, would you please forgive me? Would you save me? The Bible says in Romans chapter 3, verse 23, that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. You need to admit you're a sinner. Number two, the Bible says in Romans 6, 23, the wages of sin is death. We deserve to die and go to hell because of our sin. But Jesus died for you. He loves you. He wants you to come to heaven. And anybody that will ask him for the free salvation, God will give you the gift of eternal life, it says in Romans 6, 23. It's a free gift. And it says in Romans chapter 10 and verse 13, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. If you would just call and say, Lord, I'm a sinner, would you please forgive me? And ask Him. He will give you that free gift of eternal life. Why don't you just pray with me right now and you could receive Christ as your Savior. There's no magic words. God's looking at your heart. But if you could say this and mean it, God would forgive you. Just say, Dear Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner. I've broken your laws. I'm sorry. Please forgive me. Please apply your blood to my account. And forgive my sins and take me to heaven. In Jesus' name, amen. The Bible says, if you call upon the Lord, you shall be saved. So if you've asked the Lord to save you, He promised He'd save you. Now your job is to grow. Read your Bible, pray, get involved in a good Bible-believing church, and begin to grow to be a good Christian. Thank you so much. Call or write if we can be any help at all. We'd be glad to help. For more information on the Ministry of Creation Science Evangelism, write us at Creation Science Evangelism, P.O. Box 37338, Pensacola, Florida, 32526, USA or call us at 850-479-3466. That's 850-479-DINO. You may also visit us on the web at www.drdino.com. That's www.drdino.com.